there. That will be fine. Thank you, brethren, so very much. Thank you. John chapter 12, and beginning with verse 28. Let me back up to verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I, be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. In the book of Philippians, chapter 4, there is just a couple of verses. There are a couple of verses that I want to refer to. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech thee, Judas, and beseech thee, Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, true yoke fellow, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. God bless you. You can be seated. It was quoted a little while ago, Give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shores bring these the tempest-tossed to me, I hold a lamp beside the golden door. I feel like the cross is the key and is the lamp beside the golden door that would give you an entrance into a place where the Bible tells us that all races, every creed, every color, every nation will be represented over there. In fact, John said he saw them coming from the north and the south and the east and the west. He said the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. And that what a long march that will be when they start coming and uh, enter in at that golden door, that beautiful city, the city that lieth four square. 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high, and 1,500 miles long, a city that lieth four square. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. Many mansions are over there. That's only the headquarters for His bride. That's the place where we will have the rejoicing. That's the place where peace abounds like a river. That's the place where there is a tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God that bears twelve manner of fruit and never stops bearing. That's the place where He has invited all of us to go to. 
The lamp that stands beside that golden door is the cross of Calvary. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Brother G.T. Haywood, black minister, one of the pioneers of the wondrous faith, and introduced the Jesus name message to hundreds and thousands of people, went into his office, uh, for a time of fasting and prayer, put a sign on the door, please do not disturb. And for seven days he stayed locked up inside of his office. They would knock on the door and they would say, Elder Haywood, here is your meal. They would set the tray by the door only to come back later and find that it was untouched. He was fasting and praying and waiting upon God. And so came time for service on Sunday morning. And uh, Elder Haywood was still in his office. The church was gathered together, several hundred strong, waiting with great anticipation to hear from their leader. Finally, at the time that he felt was right, he walked out of his office. He had in one hand his Bible. He had in the other hand a piece of paper. He stood at his pulpit that morning and he said, I have something in here from the Lord for you. And I also have something here that he has given me. And then he started singing that beautiful song, I see a crimson stream of blood that flows from Calvary. Its waves which reach the throne of God are sweeping over me. When gloom and sadness whisper, you've sinned, no use to pray. I look away to Jesus, and he tells me to say, I see a crimson stream of blood. It flows from Calvary. Its waves which reach the throne of God are sweeping over me. So powerful was that song, introduced the very first time. The congregation was overwhelmed. They began to worship. They began to pray. They began to seek God. There was a time of earnest prayer, and then it turned into revival of rejoicing. They were there at 12 o'clock. They were still there at 1 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, they were still there. Word had spread. And the building was packed. And uh, finally, after two o'clock the next morning, they finally were able to go home. Such a move of God, such a mighty force, such a power of the presence and the glory of God. Just a simple song, I see a crimson stream of blood. But it was more than a song, it was a message. Because there is a trail of blood from Genesis to Revelation, a scarlet thread interwoven through the Scriptures. The Maker of the universe, as man for man, was made a curse. The claims of law which He had made unto the very uttermost He paid. His holy fingers made the bough that grew the thorns, that crowned His brow. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the very hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened o'er his head by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face by his decree was poised in space. The spear that spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. And the grave in which his form was laid was hewn from rocks his hands had made. But the throne on which he now appears was His from everlasting years. But a new glory crowns His brow, and every knee to Him shall bow. There is coming a day He was humiliated. He was brought down very low. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. When you read the 52nd, 53rd chapters of the book of Isaiah, 
You behold the vicarious suffering, limits of humiliation that a human being could be subjected to. You see him in that picture. In fact, Isaiah, when he saw him, he said, I was astonished. Or he said, I was astonished. Or I was thrown into a state of panic because I didn't know that a human being could be so brutally mistreated and look like that, so much so that he didn't even resemble the Son of Man. You see, they plucked his beard. They reached up with wicked hands and grabbed a handful of beard and jerked it out, and the chunks of flesh was torn away with it. They put a crown of thorns upon his head and took a little instrument with two handles and pushed it and pushed it down until it scraped the skull, punctured the arteries, and the blood flowed freely. They spit upon his face. They smote him with the palms of their hands. The Bible said he was beaten with rods. And then they lashed him to the column that was called the whipping post. And that Roman soldier with the cat of nine tails that had little pieces of bone and metal in the leather thongs began to beat his back every time the lash was buried into the tender flesh and jerked away little pieces of flesh was jerked away with it until when they got through, there was not a sound place left upon his back. His bones began to look out at him. In the book of Psalms, the statement is made, My bones gape at me, or they gaze at me. The flesh was torn away. The sinews were torn away. The nerves were brought to their edges. And uh, that was the bleeding, dying Lamb of God, the one who suffered for you, the one who suffered for me, the one who gave his life for you, and the one who gave his life for me. In fact, if it had not been for him, we would not be here tonight. We would not have known each other had it not been for Calvary. And when I see Brother Davidson pull out of the parking lot every Saturday morning, going from one rest home to another, visiting the sick and the afflicted, the feeble-minded, the helpless, the bedfast, going from one room to another, just gently touching them, praying with them, and ministering to them, I say, Calvary is not in vain. When I see our group go to the penal institutions around the city and around the state and have services and hold Bible studies and men are brought to their knees, I say all over again, Calvary is not in vain. Amen. That's the purpose of Calvary, was to reach out to save. And the Son of Man says, If I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I can't look at Calvary and think of Calvary without feeling something stir deep within my heart because I know that He saved us because of His shed blood. We've rejoiced here tonight. We've had a good time and fellowship together, but it was all because of Calvary. It was because of His love. He suffered. He bled. And He died. And if our lives were ever going to be effective, if our lives were ever going to count for God, sometime or another, we're going to have to take a trip where the rich, rich red blood is flowing from a place, a hill called Calvary, and dropped to the ground. No wonder the sun blinked his eyes and went out like a candle in the breeze was because it saw the blood flow freely. No wonder the earth went into convulsions because it had never witnessed blood like that blood drop to its earth before. No wonder the rocks were rent. No wonder there was an earthquake 
because it had never felt blood like that blood that flowed that day, that buried itself in that ground. Could you look at Calvary and not be affected? Could you see the blood and not be stirred? I'm telling you tonight, you may have traveled far in this world, twixt purple east and golden west, and the sunset and the polar star may have lighted o'er your transit head. Your path may have taken you o'er land and sea, but you'll never amount to anything until you go to Calvary. We've got to go there sometime. We've got to express our love all over again. We've got to say, Lord Jesus, you mean more than anything else in this world to me. We can have a church and still not have Calvary. We can have music and still not have Calvary. We can go through the process and through the form and the ritual of it all and still not have Calvary. But I want Calvary to be in the midst of everything that we do. I want Jesus to be lifted up. I want Him to be glorified. I want Him to be honored and praised. There is a thanksgiving in our hearts tonight. I know that you appreciate it. I know that the Lord is calling upon us. We're the church of the final hour. We could take the path of least resistance. We could shun the cross and the effects of the cross. And especially when you look around you and you see others, it seems like they have paid no price. They have given up nothing. And you look at them and you say, it seems like they're doing all right. They have no convictions. There are no special standards they live by. It seems like they're doing all right. But I'll tell you a religion without a cross, a religion without convictions, a religion without a Calvary is not a religion that's going to uh, get you very far, not even in this life, much less eternity. I like, I like the cross. I'm reminded that we cannot make it without the cross. He came along the road and he invited people to follow him. And he just simply said, take up your cross and follow me. In the 18th chapter of the book of Luke, there was a rich young ruler. He asked him to follow him. The Bible said he loved him, but the man had great riches. And he could not give up what he had, his possession. The very next chapter, he calls to a man that is little of stature. In fact, when he hears about Jesus, he runs down the road and he climbs up in a big sycamore tree. The huge limb uh, goes out over the, the road that Jesus will come under. But when Jesus got there, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he said, Zacchaeus, Come down. I'm going to go home with you. He was so convicted by that call that Jesus gave him. He said, Lord, the half of my goods I'll give to the poor. And if I've taken anything by false accusation, I'll restore it fourfold. Here's one man who was tied, yoked to his riches, and could not follow the Lord and take up the cross because of his riches. But here's another man that says, I'll give it all. I'll cast it overboard. I'll be a pauper. I'll go through life without anything. If I can just follow you, I'm willing to take up my cross. Somebody said there was a cross pile one day, and uh, the master came along and invited people to pick up a cross. There was a cross that was pocket size, and there was a cross that was arm size, and then there was a cross that was shoulder size, something like the one that he carried. And uh, so the individual came along and looked at it and said, I believe I will take the little cross. This cross will enable me to live the way I want to live. I can put it in my pocket. I can hide it if I want to. I can wear it around my neck. 
I'm going to tell you wearing a little cross around your neck is not carrying the cross of Calvary. I've seen people wear crosses around their neck and sit and smoke and drink and curse and go places of the world. They will swing and sway on a dance floor and every once in a while reach down and hold that little cross. You can choose the size if you want to. You can put it in your pocket. You can act like you want to act, go where you want to go, and live like you want to live. But I'm here to tell you tonight that this cross will never get you from this earth to the glory world. It's got to be something greater than that. But then you have an opportunity to choose another cross. We'll call this the convenient cross. This is just large enough to let you know you have it. You can put it under your arm. It will fit real well. You don't have to pay too big a price to carry this kind of cross. You can hide it at times when you want to. You are reminded usually all the time that you do have a cross, and it's there, but this cross just makes you wish that you could do some things that you'd like to do, but this cross won't let you. It stands as a reminder. But it doesn't let you go all the way with God. It just lets you go part way. It's like those who were willing to follow the Lord as long as they could do their own thing. They could say, suffer me first. Let me do what I want to do. And then I'll take up my cross. But Jesus said, except a man deny himself and take up his cross, he cannot be my disciple. There are a lot of people that want to wear this kind of cross. They want to shove it under their arm because they love the world. They have this world around their neck, and they still want to be a part of the world that they live in. Let me have the cross, but let me drink my booze. Let me have the cross, but let me smoke my cigarette. Let me have the cross, but let me wear my pants. Let me have a cross, but let me go where I want to go. Let me have a cross, but let me go uh, and act the way I want to act. Let me go to the swimming parties. Let me go to the proms at the high school. You see, when you try to carry this kind of cross and the world at the same time, they always get in the way of each other. When you go to pray, the cross is there, but the world is there. You're stumbling around on it. And I've pastored people, and I'm pastoring people tonight who have never been willing to make the consecration to get rid of the world. The Bible tells us, 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, it's of the world. But the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I walked along a country road one day, and lo, a stranger journeyed to. Bent low beneath the cross, the heavy cross, the load. It was the cross, the cross I knew. Take up thy cross and follow me. I hear the blessed Savior call. But we say, not now, Lord. I love the world. I love my rock music. I love my parties. I love the picture show. I love, uh, I love the television set. I love VCR. I love a lot of things. Not now, Lord. This world holds a lot for me. You see, I'm young. You see, I've got a life before me. You see, Lord, uh, it, it's not popular to separate from this world. But the Bible said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It was this world that crucified the Son of God. It was this world that spit upon him. It was this world that bruised his body, plucked his beard, and beat him on the back. 
This world, my friend, will get you in trouble. You cannot live according to the cross and live by the world. It's standard at the same time. They just don't mix. There's no way they fit together. They don't belong together. You might as well make up your mind. It is a life of separation and of dedication to the Lord. The way of the cross is a way of separation. If you're going to love the Lord, you've got to separate yourself from this world. You've got to rid yourself of this world. You've got to make up your mind. This world is not for me. This world will get me in trouble. This world will cause me to miss the rapture. I'll never be ready for the coming of the Lord as long as I live in this world loving it. The friendship of this world is enmity with God. My Bible tells me that if we're going to be a friend of the world, we will be an enemy to God. We just live in this world and work here and we make our wages and we live a life and we let our light shine. But if this world will just put up with us a little while longer, we're going to get out of here because this world is not our home. It's not our resting place. We've been invited to go to a country where the waters never freeze, frost never bites, flowers never fade, where no doctors are ever needed, where graveyards never haunt, death never comes, we've been invited to go to a better world than this. There is a lamp beside a golden door tonight. Amen. I want to emphasize this. I want you to see it. Do you have the love for the world in your heart? Is it there? Is it pulling at you? Is it like a giant magnet reaching out? Every time you would make a dedication, you only go so far. And then you think, I'll lose my friends. I won't be able to stay with my peer group. They have a good time and they have a lot of fun. And if I, if I make a consecration about this world, I'll not be able to do and live the kind of life that I want to live. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. The world will soon be gone. Paul, the great apostle, said of one man, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He wanted to wrap his arms around it. It wanted the bright lights of its world. It wanted its good times and its pleasures of sin for a season. This man that went into the catacombs of Rome, this man who was on ship with Paul, this man who saw the beatings and the suffering and the trials and certainly went through the privations that goes along with the journey with the great apostle Paul, he forsook Paul. He finally one day he said, I'm sorry, Paul. I've tried to measure up, and I've tried to develop convictions, and I've tried to live by your standards, but the world out there, it's pulling for me, and I love it, and I want to get right back into it. And history tells us that Demas died as a priest in a heathen temple. You see, when you turn your back on God, anything could happen to you. There were those that followed Jesus as long as He gave them everything that they wanted. The Bible tells us in John 6.66, there were many that turned and walked with Him no more. You see, they wanted His blessing, but they didn't want Him. They wanted what He had to offer, but they didn't want Him. He said, if you want Me, remember, you've got to eat My flesh. You've got to drink My blood. You've got to, you've got to walk the lonely road that I walk. You've got to be willing to make sacrifices that I have made. And many turned back and they didn't walk anymore with him. He didn't run down the road to try to catch them and pull them back. 
He didn't say, you can't go any further. I won't let you leave. He stood there, heartbroken. He watched them as they left him and went away. And I wonder how many times his heart is broken when he sees our failings, our inconsistency, our worldliness, our love for the world. I wonder how many times his heart has been broken. I wonder when he looks at us many times. I appreciate many of these young people that came to me the other night and they said, Brother Kilgore, when can we start having meetings after church again? When can we start having prayer meetings again? They said, we don't enjoy going out to eat. We like to pray. We, we really appreciate what God has done for us. And there's nothing wrong with going out to eat, but it's when that becomes an obsession and it pulls at us and we can't enjoy the service because of it. And we can't get anything from the Word of God because our minds are, are preoccupied with wonder what's going on out there. Something needs to get hold of us like got a hold of that congregation that heard the song, the crimson stream of blood that would keep us in the presence of God for a long time, that would keep us loving God for a long time. You see, there are too many of us, we don't linger in His presence long enough. We just barely get up there to get warm and to feel a blessing. But we don't go deep enough with groanings and moanings and with consecrations and dedications. We don't, we don't go deep enough. And as a result, when we meet the world and the devil and the flesh rises up out there, we find ourselves overwhelmed. And here we are all wrapped up in our little world again. The world passes away. That that you're trying to hold on to, someday it's going to be gone. Someday it's going to vanish away. But he that doeth the will of the Father shall abide forever. Shall abide forever. Praise God. Praise God. We need a vision of Calvary. We need to know what it's like to be yoked to the cross. You're yoked to too many things. You're interested in too many things. We need to be yoked to Calvary. We need the cross. Not a little cross. Not a convenient cross. But we need to be tied to something like this. It's heavy. It'll hurt you at times. You have to learn to wear it. But once you learn how to wear it, it just fits real well. You have to learn how to put it on. Amen. And uh, sometimes you'll stumble with it, but you'll like it because, you see, when you're yoked to this, you can't go where you want to go. This cross, it will not let you. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I can't fit with my old crowd anymore because... They want me, but they don't want my cross. And I can't get in their lifestyle because my cross won't let me fit with them. I can't go back to the places I used to go because when I try to get in the door, my cross just won't let me get in there. It seems to stop me. It holds me back. I can't get there. But I don't want to lay it down because I like the way it feels. It reminds me of my Master. It reminds me of the cross that He carried. It reminds me of the price that He paid. It reminds me that I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. 
It reminds me that I don't belong to this world, that I'm a citizen of heaven. I appreciate my country, but this world is not my home. This cross will become a golden ladder someday. I'll turn this cross into a ladder that will take me from earth to glory. So I'm going to carry my cross. I'm going to keep carrying it. I may stumble and slip and fall, and I would be lying to you tonight if I told you that I had never stumbled. I have stumbled. There have been times that I've been ashamed of myself. There have been times that I've had to go to my prayer closet again. But never one time did I ever ask the Lord to take this cross from me. I want this. This keeps me separated from that that is evil. keeps me separated from the world. It keeps me mindful of another world. It keeps me reaching for something greater. Thank God for the cross. I want to be yoked to this. I want to be hooked to this. I want to be hooked on this. Give me more of Jesus. Give me more of Calvary. Give me more of the love of God. Give me more of His blessings. Give me more, more, more. Tell me more about Jesus. Tell me more of His love. Thank God the way of the cross leads home. So the next time you pass a cross pile and you see the little cross that can be hidden and you're tempted to take it and put it in your pocket and then you think, no, I better identify myself. I'll get a convenient cross. I can serve the Lord if I want to and if I don't want to, I don't have to. I can go to church if I want to. If I don't want to, I don't have to. I'll just wear the convenient cross. No, pass it by and say, I want a cross like my master had. He's my hero. There's no hero like him. One of the young men that received the Holy Ghost in this church went home in the middle of the night, had big posters on his wall, rock stars, devil. Uh, you know, rock music is going to send more people to hell than anything I know of because the drug culture is tied to rock music. Sex sins are tied to rock music. Rebellion is tied to rock music. And I heard a Pentecostal father say that he kept warning his boys, and, but they would slip in their rooms in the middle of the night. And when he'd go to sleep, they'd listen to their records. They'd slip around and buy what they wanted. But one night, he said, about two o'clock in the morning, they burst in his room, and they woke him up out of a deep sleep, scared half to death. They got it to experimenting with their record. They got to playing it backward. And the message came loud and clear as they began to reverse the record. And it said, you don't need the golden rule. If you live by it, you'll become a fool. You don't need to obey your mother and dad. Do your own thing. Go where you want to go, and you'll be free from all of that bondage. And while they were listening to it, they said they felt something come in that room to try to take hold of them. It was a spirit, an evil spirit. And so they rushed into the room and had uh, their dad to pray for them. You see, there are some things in this world that are detrimental. There are some things that will damn your soul. And a preacher's got to be brave enough to hit those things. And I'm going to tell you, young people, older people alike, you can't wear this kind of a cross and put on bathing suits and go to Galveston. Because the Bible teaches, the Bible teaches, the Bible teaches... The Bible teaches that modesty 
is a, a virtue, a Christian virtue. You cannot be a modest person and immodestly expose your body. You don't belong to that crowd. You don't belong to that world. There comes a time for separation. You've got to take the way of the cross. Amen. It fits well. I want this. Not the bright lights. Not, not the cry and the scream of the crowd. But I want something that will enable me to walk with my Master. Once you fall in love with Jesus Christ, it's going to make all the difference in the world. I feel like that I'm here tonight because uh, I saw a cross one time. I was 12 years old, and the picture's back on the wall in the foyer, an old garage where God called me to preach. My parents were on their way to preach the gospel in another place in the state of Idaho. And uh, the car broke down. We were locked in the garage, had no money to eat food and no place to stay to get a room. And uh, we were locked inside of the garage. And my mother made pallets on the greasy garage floor. And we prayed together. I woke up in the middle of the night with a strange sensation, with a feeling that I'd never had before. And uh, I began to weep in the middle of the night. And my mother was the only one that woke up. She asked me if I was sick and uh, asked me if I was hungry and asked if I was afraid. The answer was always no. And she sensed the presence of God. And she prayed for me there in that old greasy garage. And uh, I saw Calvary, and I saw what it would mean to follow the Lord. And so I chose the way of the cross. Thank God for the cross. When you're tempted to take the path of least resistance, when you're tempted to go with the crowd, when you're tempted to be caught up in the spirit of the sage that says, Eat, drink, and be merry, I appeal to you, Life Tabernacle, Look at Calvary. Get a new vision of the cross and say, I want this. I don't want the world. I'm willing to do what God wants me to do. If you'll take Jesus Christ as your companion, if you'll take Him as your best friend, I'm here to tell you tonight, you'll never go wrong. Your life will be happy. Your life will take on a new meaning. Praise God. You'll be like this young man that ripped the, the posters off the walls in the middle of the night. I don't go with that crowd any longer. I don't want that way any longer. I have found something that's better. I have found something that's greater. Yeah,